Let me briefly talk about outliers before we turn into mixture models. Um, we haven't talked much about it. We mentioned this early on when we're talking about the mean and the standard deviation. But of course, outliers are pretty common in any statistical analysis, and we have to be aware of that. And I just want to mention that you will see most of the methods that we have derived here, uh, certainly up until now, but also many methods that we'll derive later on that, are, that also have their versions for when you have outliers in your data, okay? And remember, outliers versus inliers, right? Um, so uh, you may be familiar with RANSAC if you've taken image processing and other algorithms to deal with outliers, but specifically here for PCA, for discrete analysis, for um, other methods that we have discussed, there are many algorithms that are specifically uh, designed for that. We've seen um, one way to address outliers, and that is using the median instead of the mean, right? So remember the median in general, which you can just substitute for whatever you compute the mean, right? The median in general is defined as the sum from minus infinity to m, or I'm integrating because I'm in the continuous, not the discrete, from infinity to m is equal to from m to plus infinity, right, of f of x, where f of x, it's the density of our data, right, from where our data is drawn. Now, obviously for the Gaussian distribution, it doesn't make any sense to talk about the median because the median and the mean are exactly the same. But for other distributions, they are different. And in that case, that's uh, what you will see. For a, a general notation, you may see uh, mu one half indicating that this corresponds to the 50% point, right? So 50% of the volume is on each side of your median, right? Okay. We have another set of elements that also means that. So for example, if you have a terminal disease or someone has terminal disease, rather um, <coughs> you will hear that the expected uh, survival uh, rate is, I don't know, whatever it is, right? X years. And what it's mean by this, it's the mean, the median, right? That means that 50% of the people survive after X years, right? And 50% do not. It doesn't mean that, you know, everyone gets to that age, uh, uh, to, to that length of time. It doesn't mean that, um, that this is the mean. It means that's exactly the median. 50% of the population are either side of that number. Um, you may also see the um, median absolute deviation as another one, or MAD, median absolute deviation, which is generally computed as the median of XI minus mu one half of your data, X. Um, this is just another statistic, another robust statistic that you can compute um, that can substitute the variance um, and the covariance matrix whenever you want to use robust statistics. Another way to do that that we have seen is to weight the vectors xi, the sample vectors xi, with a weighting function w, right? And then you can either use RANSAC or some other algorithm to try to determine what is the weight for each of these uh, simple vectors. And then in that case, the mean and the median, excuse the mean, and the covariance matrix can be used, um, and they correspond to, but they correspond to the, uh, this weighted version of the mean and the covariance matrix. Another way to solve the problem is to change the equation of linear least squares. So remember linear least squares. In linear least squares, we have this equation right here. We have an error function that we want to 
uh, minimize, right? R square it's equal to the sum uh, from 1 to p, well actually n, we use n, don't we? The sum from 1 to n of of um, a1 x i1 plus a p x i p square, right? So that's what we usually have for our row, uh, our error function r. But instead of using this notation, I can use this other notation, row of this function. Now for linear list of squares, this row. Um, of x, it's equal to x squared, right? And what does this mean? That means that when I compute the error in my space, right? Like in my one dimensional space x, let's say, right? So let's say that this is x and this is my error, right? It means that I use this quadratic ex or exponential function, right? That looks like this, right? X squared, correct? But uh, nobody's stopping me from using any other function. I could use rho of x equal to the absolute value of x. Now in general, we've said that we don't use the absolute value because it's non-differentiable at the zero, right, or at the minimum, uh, which is true, but you can solve that problem. It's not too hard to solve that optimization problem. So that is a lousy excuse uh, not to use the absolute value. You could use it. It's just a little bit more complicated to run the equations. Um, but in both cases, you have a problem, especially, obviously, for linear least squares that we have discussed before, that if your error is within this margin, right, you're doing fine. But if your error is somewhere over here, then, or your error, your x rather, right, then your error is huge, right? And then because you want to minimize, right, our goal, remember, and the goal is to minimize r, then because of that, this value x will have a huge impact on the solution, right? And obviously that's an outlier. We don't want this to have an impact, right? That's why, remember, LDA was not giving us the base optimal solution in the one-dimensional space. That's why, because it uses the least square solution, right? The square, and then the means that are farther away, right, are actually biasing the first eigenvector, result of the first eigenvector. So imagine that you have this case. You have three homocedastic Gaussian distributions representing class one, two, and three, right? So let's say this is class one, two, and three. And let's assume they are homocedastic Gaussian. Then LDA will first find a subspace that optimally divides these two groups. And the reason is because this mean here is very, very far from these other two means, but these other two means are very close. So when I just square them, right, with linear least of squares, that C3, that class three, has much more relevance than any other one, right? Um, but I can use some other, uh, some other function, bro. So for example, I could come up with a row that is like linear list of squares, which works well for me, up to a point, and then I could just saturate that, right? Now, this may not be easy to do because this is, again, maybe non-differentiable at some points, but I can use a surrogate function that approximates this. And for example, there is a function that looks something like this. And this is the Cauchy function. And the Cauchy function is given by, um, it's also called the Lorentzian function, same thing. It's given by rho of x 
sigma squared over 2 times the log of 1 plus x over sigma squared. Okay? Where sigma, as always, is our variance, right? Um, so you can robustify PCA, LDA, and every other method that we have seen and will see by simply changing the least squares notation from least squares from this equation rho of x equals x squared for another one like the Lorentzian or Cauchy function. Okay. All right. Any questions? Yes, question. Uh, but that's not our problem, right? Because we have algorithms that we have already defined for nonlinear least squares that we know how to minimize, that, that we know how to use to minimize the, the uh, function. Um, so we have that, and there are ways to actually make these functions uh, convex. And actually, um, so for example, um, let me give you an example. So for example, for PCA, you could redefine PCA as the minimization of the following error function from one through n of your original xi's, okay, minus vq, vq transpose xi, okay? And what that means, that's still with the two norm, right? And what that is, is the reconstruction error, right? So you're projecting xi onto the PCA space of q dimensions, right, from P to Q, and then you project it back onto the original space, right? And you want to make sure that this distance is as small as possible, right? So that's the error that you want to minimize. And you can actually change that in a variety of ways. So for example, one function that you can come up with, it's the exact same thing that you have here, but now I'm going to add the weight, right? And that weight is going to determine how far away points are, okay? And then this is going to be the same thing. And then maybe I'm going to add a regularizer. And we haven't really defined that yet, but uh, there's a reason to do that. And if you do it this way, then it has closed form, right? Um, there are other variants of that that use an algorithm that we'll see today, hopefully. It's called the EM algorithm which is not the closed form solution, but it's a way to find solutions for non-convex problems like this. Okay. More questions? Can we move on? Excellent. So let's move on to mixture models then. All right, make your models. We just have two more topics that are extensions of everything that we've seen until now before we can use all this to design the really co the coolest, more modern <coughs> algorithms that people use in machine learning pattern recognition, okay? All right, so until now, we have assumed that our data, right, when I have in my space, so I have my p-dimensional space, let's call it rp in the real domain, and I have my simple feature vectors, right, maybe like this, I have assumed that this are given by some Gaussian distribution or maybe a sub-Gaussian or, or sub-Gaussian, sub right? So if I had to estimate the with a Gaussian distribution, this would probably be it. This would be my covariance matrix and the mean would be somewhere here, right? Okay. 
So that has been our assumption. However, it is very unlikely that our data is truly uh, drawn from a normal distribution. Of all the infinite distributions I could have, what are the chances that it turns out to be a normal distribution? Um, it could be a sub-Gaussian, it could be a super-Gaussian, but um, most generally, it's going to be something more complex than that. So let's uh, assume a generic distribution. So let's say that I have a generic distribution f of x, okay, with PDF, with um, probability density function, f of x, small f now, equals to, now instead of defining this as a single Gaussian distribution like here, or a super Gaussian or sub Gaussian, I'm going to define this as the sum of multiple distributions. Okay, so let's say that I have g, g the number of uh, PDFs or distributions, okay? And um, capital PI, it's the prior or the prior for that specific distribution. And then F of I of X, okay? Now, Fi can be any distribution. It could be a normal distribution. It could be a Laplacian. It could be a semicircle. It could be a step function. You name it, right? Any type of distribution that we want. Now, um, there is a, a constraint, right? This is subject to the sum of my priors, capital PIs, has to be equal to 1 right because all the priors cannot be more than one so this is the sum of the pi's has to be equal to one all right we're also going to assume that these functions are parametric parametric densities right as we have done thus far meaning that there's a number of parameters that specifies them, like the Gaussian, the Laplacian, the semicircle, the step function, you have. Okay. And so in that case, you will see probably this other notation, f of x, that we will use actually pretty often. And as we get into support vector machines, other linear and nonlinear classifiers, uh, kernel methods and deep learning, you'll see this kind of notation very often. Um, f of x and then semicolon, uh, then maybe the parameters, so let me call this upsilon, right? This should be capital, upsilon, okay. It's a little better. Um, and now here's the same as before, i from one to g of my priors and now each function is given by fi of x and its parameters so let's call it theta i okay where upsilon here it's equal to so upsilon specifies the parameters of this mixture of different models right different distributions or pdfs right and that upsilon has all the parameters, which include obviously the theta i's for each PDF, but also the pi's, right? So this has to have from p1 through pg minus one, and then theta one all the way to theta uh, g, okay? Now note, I have only gone to PG minus one. Anyone can tell me why? Very good, because the sum of all the PIs is one, so the last one, um, it's given, right? I don't have to estimate it. It's already given by the other, um, or I don't have to know it. Okay, um, so, this um, parameters upsilon of our density are defined in some space. So let's call this a space omega, right? 
so say that this is included in some space, right? This is the parameter space. And that parameter space will be a subset or a subspace of some, say, real domain, if I'm in the real domain of R, right, where R is the number of total parameters that we have. Now, more, more uh, often than not, this equation, this is the most general equation that you'll see, but more often than not, you will see this other notation where there is no i in f sub i, right? Um, oops, um, I forget, that's uh, fine, um, right? You will see this. And what this means in that case is that this mixture of densities, okay, this mixture model right here, this mixture is a mixture of several densities of the same form, okay? So all Gaussians, all Laplacians, all what have you, right? So whenever you don't see this sub i here, that's what it means, that they all come from the same type of distribution. So for example, let's see an example of this and this is something you I encourage you to implement in MATLAB tonight it takes just a few minutes and you'll see how this works because this is fundamental to understand most of what we'll do in the second part of the course um, so let's say I give you this function of x given p1 mu1 B mu two sigma that define the prior of the first distribution, the first PDF, which is a Laplacian distribution or PDF. Okay. The second prior, I'm not going to include it because you know what it is. It's one minus P one, and then the second PDF, it's a normal PDF, the, norm, uh, the PDF of a normal distribution. Um, so let me write this down. This is going to be Q1 over 2 times B, this is the Laplacian, the exponential of negative X minus mu1 absolute value over B plus P2, the normalizing constant of the normal distribution, remember, is 2 pi sigma square uh, square root and the Gaussian is given by x minus mu 2 square divided by sig uh, 2 times sigma square. Right? Okay, and implement this in MATLAB tonight and then you can vary the parameters of that mixture model, right? And for example, this is an example you have in the slides that I implemented in my lab uh, with P1 equals 2.3, mu1 was equal to 1, B equal to 2, uh, mu2 equal to 4, and sigma equal to 2. And this is what you'll see. This is what you get in two dimensions. You will see a distribution that looks something like this. You have it in the slides. I'll make sure you look at this because it's more accurate than what I'm going to draw here. This should be rounder. So, so it looks something like this. Okay, what does this mean? So this is my mixture model, right? This is a mixture model. And what does this mean? It means that when I draw samples from that distribution F, so this is my F, right? When I draw samples from that distribution, I'm going to have observations mostly around here, right? 
and around here. Now remember that the Gaussian has a wider density around the mean than the Laplacian, but the Laplacian has heavier tails, right? So you'll see more points here than you will probably see here, right? Okay. So once you have that distribution, you can draw samples from it and plot them in that one dimensional space, right? And then you'll see that distribution of points following the density that we have, right? So it means now that here in my original problem that I draw, that I drew here, that now I can use, say, a mixture of Gaussians to estimate this instead of just one, right? And that that explains the density that I observe in my training samples better than if I had just used a single normal distribution. All right, next thing, obviously, is how are we going to estimate the parameters given a set of training samples, right? So I'm now given a set of training samples, and I want to estimate these parameters of my distribution that I have right here, right? Because these parameters are not given to me, right? Now, what I do have to make an assumption on is on the form of my distributions, right? And obviously, we'll get to that. The most classical assumption is a normal assumption. So you're going to assume that f is a normal distribution. but um, in general, it could be anything, right? It could be a T distribution. Um, it could be T distributions. It could be Laplacians. It could be normal distributions, etc. Or it could be a mixture of all of them, right? Okay. Now, to estimate the parameters, what are we going to do? We're going to be um, so. Theoretically, you want to compute the maximum likelihood estimator, right? Um, fortunately, that doesn't exist. I mean, it doesn't exist. It cannot be computed, right? Um, you can try if you have taken estimation theory and you know how to do this, which is what we did for the mean, remember, and the covariance matrix, and obviously uh, sigma, uh, the variance, and so on. Um, you can try, but it just doesn't work for this. There's no known way to do it. Uh, but there is another way that we have seen to determine the parameters of the distribution, which is to do what? Take the, anyone? Take the partial derivative of some function, right? with respect to the parameters, right? And the maximum likelihood estimator is given by the log likelihood, right? So let me define, so if I define L uh, given my parameters epsilon as the likelihood, what would be the likelihood of this mixture that I have here? would be the likelihood, the product of these densities, right? So this is gonna be given to me by the product from one through G, did I say? Of um, F, or actually, um, one I just don't, yeah, yeah. Um, let me simplify this to my number of samples, N, and then I'm gonna do Xi for the ith sample, and the parameters, okay? Let me do that. And now I wanna take the partial derivative of this likelihood with respect, what am I doing? <laughs> with respect to the parameters, right? I'm writing gamma and I wanna run epsilon, okay. 
Now as always, I'm going to take the log to make this more appealing. So if I take the log of this function, then this is equal to the sum of from um, from i from 1 to n of the log of f of x i and my parameters. And this is equal to the sum of from 1. Actually, hold on a second. Let me use j here because I'm going to use i to be consistent with this i. Uh, what is it? To be consistent with this i with the number of models. I'm going to use i here. So this is 1 through n, the log of now the sum. This is substituting f for the mixture that I have there, uh, which is i from 1 through g of the prior times fi of xj epsilon, right? Okay. So now solving that equation, you know, to find the, mi the minimum or the maximum. So in that case, we're interested in the maximum because this is the log likelihood and you want to maximize the log likelihood. That's the same as, you know, a, an inflection point, which is equal to zero, um, the departure derivative equal to zero. So if you do that, then solving for this equation, as we have done prior in many instances by now, you're going to get that the priors, pi, and I'm going to add a hat here to indicate that this is the estimate that I obtained. Remember, like mu hat, sigma hat. Um, then in practice, we're not going to write the hat, but I just want you to know now that this is an estimate, okay? It's not the true one. This is going to be equal to 1 over n, the sum from 1 through n of pi xj given your epsilon parameters. And I'm going to use a hat for epsilon because these are the ones I'm going to estimate next, which are going to be given by this equation, i from 1 through g and j from 1 through n of the posterior of xj epsilon hat times the partial derivative of fi of xj theta i over the partial derivative of theta, okay, the parameters. Okay, and that should be equal to zero. And final one, last one, it would be pi of xj given the parameters, oops, epsilon hat, it's equal to the prior of that mixture of that model times the density of that model, xj theta i over we need to normalize this for all the densities of all the models that I have in my mixture. So I'm going to do, say, k now from 1 through g of fk xj theta k, right? Oops. Um, sorry. I forgot the prior pk fk. Come. Now, the problem with this solution is that it has multiple zeros, so it has multiple solutions. Um, so we have to 
use, utilize some method that we have already defined that allows us to find a solution for this. And because we are using a nonlinear least squares formulation, as I mentioned, right, by using the, um, the gradient direction to find the maximum in that case, then we need an initial estimation for epsilon, right? So we need to initialize this as we have done before with other methods. We need to initialize my epsilon. Let's call it epsilon at time zero, okay? That would mean the time at zero. Or you could also write just zero if you prefer. Um, so you need to initialize this, right? as we have done for other nonlinear least of squares problems. And now the goal is to iterate this process of computing the priors and the uh, posterior and the parameters, right? And this is done with an algorithm, a famous algorithm that if you've taken estimation theory, you have surely seen, which is called the expectation maximization algorithm. And it, I know it comes by a different name, but all these things I want you to realize are one and the same, right? We keep com coming back to the same formulation over and over and over again. Okay. So we're going to use for these mixture models to estimate the parameters of these mixture models the expectation maximization algorithm. Yes. Uh, if, if my understanding is correct, the PI should be the probability of the uh, ingredient of the mixture model. It should be the probability of what again? Of one like submodel of the mixture model, right? Submodel? Yeah. The prior of, of one, this is the prior of each of the models. Okay, yeah. So on the right hand side is the underground truth, uh, ground truth. The ground truth. PI, right? What? PI should be the probability for one model. Ground PI truth. Is. There is no ground truth. But how, how uh, do we know PI? This is the posterior that I have computed here. No, this is the same equation for the posterior that we have been using until now. This is not a new definition of a posterior, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, double check. The fx uh, semicolon p1 mu b mu2 sigma, the p1 here. Where are you? The first equation is different from the p, pi here, right? This one? Yeah, the p1. No, no, that's the exact same thing. This is, the prob this is the prior, or the weight, if you prefer, the prior probability for this first distribution. And the prior for the second distribution is 1 minus P1. Yeah. That's exactly the same as this one. But that is unknown. Of course, that's why we're doing this. So that's, that's an algorithm to find these unknowns. No, no. If you have this, you can estimate this, okay? If you have this, you can estimate the parameters here. And if you have this, right, meaning the parameters and the priors, then you can estimate this. And that's what I said, that you can start with an assumption of an initial value for the parameters, right? And with this initial values, you can compute this things. And then with those, you can compute this and iterate that. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now, which is called the expectation maximization algorithm. That's exactly what we're going to show how to do. OK. This is generally known as the EM algorithm.
for expectation maximization. E stands for expectation, M for maximization. So the problem is how are we going to iterate this? And we're going to use yet another trick that we have already seen. We're going to add a set of variables that are non-observable variables, OK? All right, so I'm going to define as always these non-observable variables as vector z, which uh, I'm going to define as z1 uh, through zn meaning that I have a vector for each of the n observations that I have, okay? And these are the non-observable or latent variables. And I'm going to say that it's each zj here is given by cj1 through cjg, where g corresponds to, again, the number of models I have in my mixture. Now, cij here, or CJI, rather, is equal to 1 when XJ belongs to the ith, mixture, uh, ith model, OK? If XI is drawn from F, uh, actually, XJ, am I right? Yeah, XJ is drawn from fi, okay, and zero otherwise. Let's see how this works, right? Yes. So, so J is the well, yeah, um, we'll get to that. CJIs uh, can take other values, okay? okay. So but ideally, right, if you knew from which of the models it's drawn, that would be one and zero. Yeah, it could be. It could be. All right. Um, so these are the unobservable variables. This is not known to me. Um, and now I'm going to define a new vector, which I'm going to call the complete vector or complete feature vector. Let's call it C, C vector, which is equal to my knowns, right? My simple feature vector, X transpose, and the corresponding non-observable vector, Z. Okay. Now, using this, I can define the log of my likelihood that I have used before. Now, I'm going to add a notation here that you'll typically see this likelihood here may have a C here, meaning that corresponds to the likelihood of the complete data, not just the observed or unobserved, OK? But otherwise, exact same thing. And this is equal to what we had before, the summing from 1 through g and 1 to n of zji times the log of the prior plus the log of the function fi of xj given my parameter c epsilon. Okay. Okay. So far, so good. All right, so the EM algorithm is divided into two steps, which, as I said, they iterate, right? You iterate one step, the, the E step, or expectation step, and the maximization step, or M step. Here we use the current estimate of the parameters, right? At each step, the current estimate of the parameters. Uh, let's call them epsilon T, as I said before, right? With the initial one being epsilon zero. And then um, the E step, which is stay, uh, stands for expectation, 
means that I'm going to compute the expectation value, right? So let's define this a Q of upsilon given uh, upsilon at time t. Thus, I'm going to compute it as the expected value of the log of LC of the parameters u epsilon given x. And now here I'm going to write down here u epsilon t, meaning that this estimate of this function is taken given my current estimate or current knowledge of the parameters, okay? All right, so that is the E or expectation step. The M step is the maximization step. And as its name implies, I'm just going to take the maximum of this function now. Okay? So I'm going to find the parameters u epsilon at time t plus 1 that maximize this function of the expectation value, right? Uh, so I'm going to do the arguments that maximize Q u epsilon u epsilon at time t. Okay, see how this works. So I first estimate my function of the log likelihood, and then I find the parameters that maximize that estimation, right? So I iterate E and M until I reach a maximum in that case. And how do I know that I've reached a maximum? I'm never going to reach the exact maximum, but I'm going to get, gonna get very close, right? What's going to happen is in the maximum of my function, right, these increments that I have that I'm doing are going to be a smaller and a smaller and a smaller until I reach the maximum, right? So what I'm going to write is when u epsilon at time t plus 1 minus u epsilon at time t is a smaller than some epsilon, some small value epsilon, epsilon larger than 0, then I'll stop. Okay. All right, so is that a good algorithm, right? It's a famous algorithm. There is a reason for that. And that is because it has been shown and we're going to do the derivations here, but I will post in Carmen a paper that shows these derivations. It has been shown a couple of very important properties of this, which is using the EM algorithm, first important proof uh, or lemma, is that the likelihood that you obtain with the Upsilon, upsilon parameters that you have at time t plus 1 with the EM algorithm is always larger or equal than the log likelihood with the upsilon parameters that you had at time t. That is guaranteed with the EM algorithm. Okay? There's a very nice proof that shows that. Okay? So obviously that means that you're always going toward the maximum. Now you can be unlucky and you can get into a saddle point and you can get a stack, right? Um, but you're always guaranteed not to reduce or to go lower, to, to, to go to a lower likelihood, uh, toward a minimum. And the other one is that we know the rate of convergence. The rate of convergence
is given by u epsilon at time t plus 1 minus u epsilon star. Now remember from our last lecture what I said. I think I said that, and if not, <laughs> let me say now. When you use the star, you mean either the minimal or the maximal, right? The actual solution point that we are looking for, right? So when we subtract our solution at time t plus 1 from the maximal that I'm trying to get, this I can approximate by taking the Taylor expansion. Um, and the Taylor expansion, as you know by now, it's nothing else than the Jacobian of the first order. I'm just going to take the first order Taylor expansion. The Jacobian about my uh, solution times u epsilon at time t minus u epsilon star, okay? Now, for that, then you can compute the, the global rate of convergence as the limit of u epsilon at time t plus 1 minus u epsilon star normalized by u epsilon at time t minus u epsilon star, okay? Now, as you, this is nothing else than what I said here, right? But as you keep increasing in the number of iterations, right, and the number of data points, then this will tell you the rate of convergence. Now, this is unknown, right? I mean, if we did know, see, why, why are we here? So in practice, what you will do is you'll substitute this by a t and this one by a t minus 1 t, right? And that gives you an approximation of how well you're doing, OK? All right. Again, I'll post a paper that goes into the details of this. And I'm pretty sure that if you take estimation theory, then they'll go over the M algorithm in detail. Um, so you can see by now, in machine learning and pattern recognition, there are a number of topics that you have to be familiar with that are important for you to explore, right? One is obviously optimization. Um, you need to know optimization, or at least the basics of optimization. Doesn't mean that you need to take all the courses on optimization theory, but at least you have to have some familiarity of methods of convex and non-convex optimization. Um, the other one is estimation theory, of course, right? And obviously, I'm assuming that if you're taking this course, you know linear algebra and ideally uh, some um, random variables and maybe um, some other statistics, um, especially stochastic processes. Okay. All right. So let's now rewrite these equations that we had here for the normal case, right? So as I said, the most general application of this is for a mixture of normal models. So now we can substitute this Fi that I have here for the density of a normal distribution, right? Okay. So let me do that here. Again, as always, this is in the slides. And I'm going to post another paper that has all the derivations in case you want to verify this. Um, important. So I think I already erased, except for one, the equations. But the same equations that I had here and this one, right? So if I now fit it in the normal model, I'm going to have that at time t plus 1, the prior is going to be equal to, let's see, the determinant, the square root, negative square root of the determinant of the ith class at time t, obviously, 
times the exponential function of the normal distribution, right, which is negative one half of xj minus mu i transpose sigma i at time t inverse times anyone? Come on, you should know this by heart by now. Times xj minus mu i, right? Correct? Our Mahonovitz distance. And I need to normalize this because this is a prior, right? So this is the probability of every simple xj belonging to the ith distribution, right? Right? This is what this measures. So I have to normalize this by what else? Since it's a prior. The summation of what? Of, right, but the summation of what? Of all the, all the distributions, right? All the PDFs. Okay, so I'm going to have summing over, let's call this K, from 1 through G of the same term, right? So now I'm going to have KT of the exponential of one half x k uh, x j mu k excuse me at time t uh oops we forgot time t here at the mu's um uh, sigma k at time t inverse x j minus mu k at time t all right there we go right makes sense so what's this doing when I compute the expected value? Well, it's just computing what is the probability of xj to belong to the ith normal distribution, right? This is the probability, right? So that not, is nothing else than if I have this fi here, or let me call it ni for the normal distribution, right? This ni here, right? And I have an xj here. What is this doing? It's computing the Mahonovitz distance, right? From xi to mu i, xj to mu i, right? Given that mu i and sigma i, right? Correct? So it, de it determines how close this is, and then from that distance it computes the probability, right, of belonging to it, right? But because this is a prior, I need to normalize it by the probability that it belongs to all the distributions, right, such that the sum of all the pijs is going to be equal to one, right, at the end. Great. Wonderful. So this is the prior. Now, so this is the step, obviously. The M step, I compute the mean, right? The parameters now, the upsilon, right? Which are my parameters, which are the means and the covariances. So the mean of the ith normal model at time t plus one is going to be equal to, now if you substitute for these equations that we had here, you should get the sum from one through n of pij at time t xj over the sum from one through n of P i j at time t. Uh, are you surprised about this result? You should not be surprised. What's this equation? This is a simple mean, right? But the simple mean, if I only had one Gaussian distribution and n samples, it would be 1 over n, the sum of all the samples, right? But now, because I have the priors instead, what I do, I multiply xxj by the prior of my ith model, right? 
and I divide this by the sum of all the priors for that simple, right? For each of the simples to normalize it. That's the same as 1 over n, the sum of all the simples, when I only have one Gaussian distribution. And the sigma at time t plus 1 is equal to the sum from 1 through n of pij at time t times xj minus mu i at time t xj minus mu i at time t transpose divided by again the sum of my pij's at time t okay and this two form the m step or the maximization right and again this was not surprising to us this result neither is this one right because what is this this is the exact same equation that we derived for the covariance matrix for one normal distribution right which is xj minus mu i times xj minus mu i transpose this is the covariance matrix now covariance matrix we normalize it by again one over n and the number of samples but now we're not discussing whether I have n samples or not we're discussing where it belongs to the distribution i or the distribution k right and for that I need to multiply it every time I compute this covariance matrix by the prior probability that the sample belongs to this class or excuse me this class to this model this normal model and, and normalize this by all the priors right okay yes question um, all this parameter estimation assumes that the number of distribution is known known yes we'll get to that in a second yes very good question Professor, yeah um, in the update formula for mu the summation in the denominator, mm. is it, uh, the index of the summation, sh shouldn't it be like... Oh, J. J. Did I say I? And should be J. Yes. Thank you. All right. Very good. Right? So again, that means that we need an initial estimate for mu and sigma. Right? I just have to have an initial estimate. And we'll get to that too, how to get this initial estimate. Now, getting back to a previous question that we had here, what happens to my PIJs, right? Now know that the PIJs may actually take any value between zero and one, right? So a sample can belong to a model or another with different weights, right? Okay. Now, this, when we talk about clustering, so this, uh, if you want to do clustering, this would be a method that we'll talk about this later on uh, in the course. When we talk about clustering, mixture models is a classical algorithm to do so. And in that case, this is called soft clustering. Soft because each sample can correspond to multiple models compared to hard clustering, where each sample is forced to just belong to one of the models, okay? And we'll extend this in a second to, for that case, when we extend this to hard clustering, or um, each sample belongs to just one of the models, this algorithm is called the k-means algorithm, which is a famous clustering algorithm. Now, um, this algorithm is only guaranteed, to, it's only guaranteed to find you, obviously, a solution, right, from an initial point, because there are multiple solutions, remember? Um, so there are multiple ways to try to find a better estimate. A good one that doesn't take much effort, but it's really slow, is you initialize your parameters of your mixture model multiple times, right, hundreds of times, 
you apply the EM algorithm for all of them, and then you pick up the one that gives you the maximum of all these maximums, right? Maximum likelihood, I mean. Um, you use more sophisticated optimization algorithms. Um, there is one, for example, that I used way back. I had a paper on this sometime like years, years ago. Um, I use an optimization method called genetic algorithms that I'm not going to describe here. But it's just another optimization algorithm that allows you to do what I just said, but in a more intelligent way. And that actually leads to a really good solution really fast. Okay? Um, you can use simulating annealing, which is uh, something related to genetic algorithms, which will lead to very similar solutions. Um, all right, so following the question that we had here, had a really good question. How about the number of components? in our mixture. What's the number of components in our mixture? So until now, I have assumed <laughs> that G is known. But generally, G is not known. Now, we know of a method, because we're, we're maximizing the log likelihood here, right? We're maximizing the log likelihood. We have to find a method that is optimal, right? Which is, what was the method, the criterion, rather? What's a criterion? The base criterion, right? So I could use base to find the optimal number of models in my mixture, right? That means that what would give me the smallest base error, right, of defining if I have to to find the structure, the underlying structure, so to speak, or density, more formally. If I need to define the exact density of my observations, I could compute the base error on how well I do with a given estimate of a density, right? You see what I'm saying? Yeah? Now, let me tell you, or let me give you a solution. You cannot use the base error. And what I want to ask you is why? Why can't I use the base error? I mean, you could. I mean, it's possible, right? I mean, the equations are right there. You have the equations. You can use it. But in practice, it's going to give you an incorrect result. Why? Now, remember. I'm trying to find the underlying density. That's unknown to me. The underlying density of my data is completely unknown to me. If it were known to me, we would not be here. Seriously, <laughs> it's end of story, problem solved, right? Um, but I need to estimate the underlying distribution of my data. I have no idea how to do it. I can use a mixture of normal models or a mixture, uh, uh, mixture of other models to estimate that, right? But I don't know how many elements or components I need to add in my mixture. Now, for a, if I only had one, say that I have a mixture of normal models, right? If I only had one Gaussian, then I could estimate mu and sigma, and then see how well the data points that I have are represented by the single Gaussian, right? Then I could use two Gaussians. And then I could see how well these two uh, my samples are, are how accurate this, uh, my samples would be drawn, or how, how likely, rather, it is that my samples are drawn from these two Gaussians, right? And how can I do this with the base error, right? What is the probability that it belongs or it does not belong to these distributions, right? So what would be the optimal base solution, the base optimal solution to my problem? What is the optimal number of models G in my mixture models according to the base criterion? Exactly. If I have one normal model or one model for each of my samples, then I do excellent. I represent my data perfectly, 
right? This is something that we'll later call overfitting, okay? So yeah, I can represent my samples absolutely perfectly. Base is going to say, wow, you're doing really great. This is the best you can ever do. Yeah, but one model per sample doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't tell me anything about the underlying distribution. It just models the, the samples I have. That's useless to me, right? So we are stuck. There is no easy solution to that. If we cannot use base, yeah, it's, um, that is very, very problematic. So um, instead, we need to define some other type of of method. And I'm, again, not going to um, describe this in detail for the simple reason that there is no known solution to that problem, OK? Uh, most people to this day will just assume a certain number of, of, mix, of models, right, in the mixture. That's it. But there are two methods that people have used. One is called the minimum description length approach or criterion, or MDL for short. It stands for, again, a minimum description length criterion. And the other one is the AIK criterion. Now you have both um, the AIK, uh, actually, rather than the AIK, um, we'll talk more generally, talk about uh, more specifically the base information criterion or Bayesian, maybe. BIC. Now you have the derivations of both of them in your slides and in the paper posted in Carmen. Okay, um, but let's talk primarily about minimum description length because this is a point or a topic that's going to come over and over again in machine learning. When in doubt. If you have two models, right? One model has 10 normal distributions. The other one has eight normal distributions, OK? If you have two models, and they seem to be doing pretty much equally well, which one should you prefer? The simplest one, eight, correct. Um, why? We don't know. <laughs> Right? And that goes back to Ackman's racer. It says, given two options, just choose the one that is simplest. OK? That seems to work pretty well in general. Remember LDA, linear discriminant analysis, with all the criticism that I've given it? Remember PCA, which is just simple, a straightforward list of squares? These methods still to this day are extremely powerful and used all the time. Why? Because they are just so simple. When we get, again, later on in the course to actually describe overfitting more formally, okay, like we have briefly discussed here today with one Gaussian per sample, <laughs> uh, that would be overfitting. You can represent your data perfectly, right? But you're not representing unseen data, a term that we will later call generalization, that you can actually generalize to unobserved data. Um, then it turns out that if you lose or loosen, loosen the uh, restrictions on this overfitting and you're less accurate on your training data, you do generally better in practice uh, for uh, the samples that you haven't seen. Now, I have to warn you that I just said something that is true and untrue at the same time. It's true because when we apply it in practice, we see this happens. But it's theoretically incorrect. 
I'm going to show you later a theorem. It's called the no free lines theorem that disproves this point. Okay? It actually states broadly that no model or no algorithm can be better than any other model or algorithm in general. Okay? But be careful of what I just said because you know what an algorithm is? So let's say that we're talking about classification. Okay? You had in one of your projects a classification uh, problem where you had to classify images into a set of categories, right? That's categorization, classification. If I design an algorithm, uh, the simplest machine learning algorithm you can ever design, which is given a new image, an, an unobserved, right, a test image, I randomly assign it to a category, randomly, completely at random. The no free lines theorem that we'll discuss says that you can never, ever <laughs> design an algorithm that it's better than this. Because in general, no algorithm can be better than, anyone else, than anything else. Now, I know you're looking confused, but what did I say the very first day of class? that unless you have what, you cannot do better than chance. Unless you have... Mm -mm. Unless you have some knowledge about your problem. You have to know something about your problem. Or you can make some assumptions if you don't know anything about your problem. You can make some assumptions that are reasonable within your problem they, that for example they model the physics the real physics of your world that you're working in right um, but remember that no one is immune to that not even basic math and I, I gave you a link to a video that uh, talks about the Banach Tarski paradox I know some of you have watched it but if you haven't please watch it because it's fascinating work right it's this Banach Tarski paradox the one that uh, says that if you have a ball of radius r, you can partition it in a small number of, I think it's four or five or six different portions, and then translate them, rotate them, putting them back, and you end up with two balls of the same size as the original one, which is, of course, ridiculous. Um, okay. Um, you have in the slides, I'll probably uh, go through this very quickly um, next time, but in the slides you have the same derivations that I've done here for the normal distributions, but for T distributions, okay? And the point of having this in the slides is to show you some other result for some other type of distribution, okay? Um, the uh, T distributions um, are actually very practical in um, many instances. Some people call it the student's T distribution because a student, a famous mathematician, uh, did work uh, a lot with that distribution. Um, okay, um, one final thing to mention is a look back at factor analysis. So let me do this very quickly. It'll take just a minute. Remember factor analysis? Now, you may realize you might have realized that what we did here, that trick of using unobserved latent variables is related to factor analysis, right? And in fact, you can use the EM algorithm to solve for factor analysis, right? So we've already seen an algorithm to find latent variables, which was ICA, right, in the bank component analysis. But let me tell you, let me show you how you can apply the EM algorithm for factor analysis as well. Now recall that when we discuss factor analysis, we define this famous linear model where X is equal to a mix, mixing matrix W times my um, my latent variable z and some error function psi, okay? 
All right. Um, now, in that case, remember, when I write it with psi, this is a diagonal matrix um, of corresponding error elements, OK? Now, we can define this as the probability of x given my latent variables is equal to the probability of x given. Now, my latent variables can be described according to this linear model that I have here. Right? So I can have, um, let's see, I can have wz plus mu and phi. And now if I assume, I know that we keep saying I assume, I assume, I assume, but this is machine learning, right? In machine learning, you'll see that we keep assuming things to, to make the equations work. Uh, that my density is, or my distribution rather, is a normal distribution. Then that means that Px of z is equal to the normal distribution of x given my model wz plus mu, right? And now I can use the EM algorithm to estimate these parameters. And here, the maximum likelihood estimates will be, let's see, the estimate of the mean of my latent variables, right? The expected value, which is the mean, right? The expected value is going to be equal to G W T transpose Wt is w at time t, same thing as we did before. Um, phi at time t inverse, phi or psi, I think that's psi, right? I keep forgetting. Um, and times xi minus x bar, the mean of all the samples that I have. And zi, zi transpose, this is for the covariance matrix. Remember, this is equal to G plus the expected value of ZI times the expected value of ZI transpose. Now here, G is equal to the identity matrix plus WT transpose psi at time T inverse W at time T all these inverse, and then remember, this is nothing than the pseudo inverse because I'm adding the identity matrix to make it invertible. Um, so this would be the expectation step, or E step, right? Where I compute the expected value. And the M step would be to estimate W at time T plus one, which would be given by the sum of xi minus x bar times the expected value of zi transpose times, so all this, times the sum from 1 through n of the expected value of zi zi transpose inverse. And I have now the errors at time t plus 1, which is the diagonal of um, S, the uh, matrix that we had computed early on, with uh, minus w t plus 1 uh, I think times 1 over n the sum from 1 through n of the expected value of zi times xi minus x bar transpose. OK. All right. This is the EM algorithm applied to factor analysis. Same thing as we did before. All right. I'll see you on Thursday.